So far we've talked a lot about how to take a map and represent it with a matrix and if we already have one matrix representation for this with respect to one basis, we also talked a lot about how to represent this function with a uh, different matrix with respect to a different basis. So um, what is this all good for? Um, well, I mean, we can always just use a standard basis, so why bother ever switching to another basis? So the question then becomes, um, what basis should we be using? Is the standard basis really always the most optimal or is there sometimes a better choice? So to answer this question, I want to um, point you at the diagram that we talked about last time when we talked about similar matrices. So if we have a matrix A represents a map with respect to um, a basis B for you know the domain and codomain, which are equal. So we have Specifically, we're working with linear maps from Rn to itself or a vector space to itself. Um, and let's say we have M as a matrix which represents the same map just with respect to a different basis D being a basis for the domain and codomain. Um, so we said that A and M are going to be similar matrices, meaning that A is equal to... Um, P inverse M P and uh, is that right? Yeah, A would be equal to P inverse M P. Uh, maybe the other way around. Maybe it's P M P inverse. Uh, I'm not gonna figure it out right now. But um, anyway, so um, anyway, if two matrices represent the same map, it can sometimes be advantageous to work with the simpler matrix. And that's what I want to talk about today. So, um, for uh, so for today's example, the main example is going to be diagonal matrices, which are often easier to understand. Diagonal matrices are easier to work with, and the main idea I want to get across to you today is that uh, if we have a diagonal representation of a function with respect to some basis, the basis might be weird. Um, that's advantageous for us because that tells us certain things about the function. So, um, here's our definition. A linear map f from vector space to itself is diagonalizable if there is a basis b for our vector space such that the representation of f with respect to b and b is a diagonal matrix. So we've already we've already seen examples of this in uh, previous sections when we talked about uh, changing um, map representations. Um, so I don't want to do uh, more examples like this, uh, but we will we will see examples of, of actually how to diagonalize things. Um, what we didn't talk about was uh, how can we diagonalize a matrix, and that'll be. Uh, half goal for today and more a goal for the next uh, lecture, for the next section rather, when we talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Oh, uh, adding on to this definition, this definition extends to just matrices. So a matrix is diagonalizable if there is a non-singular matrix P such that P A P inverse is a diagonal matrix. So, um, these are basically saying the same things because, so um, if we have a matrix, uh, so I guess, I guess I should have called this matrix A. Um, but anyway, if A is like the representation of a function F with respect to um, some basis like D uh, for both the domain and codomain, um, then if we can find a different basis B for our vector space such that the representation of F with respect to that basis is a diagonal matrix, then A and um, that new representation uh, differ by change of basis matrices um, and hence they would be similar matrices. Um, specifically when I say that they're, they differ by change of basis matrices, that would be like uh, if your change of basis matrix is P, then it would be like P, A, P inverse, or P inverse A, P. Anyway, 
Um, moving on. So here's an example. Let's suppose that A is this diagonal matrix with diagonal entries 2, negative 4, 3. Let's say that A represents a map F from R3 to R3 with respect to some basis B1, B2, and B3. Um, and so I'm not saying uh, what uh, B1, B2, B3 are in this case. I just kind of want to get across to you like why, why this would be useful no matter what this basis looks like. Okay, so to, to understand why this is useful, uh, I first have to remind you uh, what it means to represent a map. Um, so for any V in R3, if I take a representation with respect to our basis of our vector, and I multiply that by A, then that should give me the representation of F of V with respect to our basis B. Um, and if we're... Um, if A were the representation, this is this is because A is equal to the representation of F with respect to B for the domain and codomain. Um, if it were D over here, then it would be D right here. But anyway, um, so how do we use this? First thing to note is that, um, well, what is the representation with respect to B of B1, think to yourself, what, what should this be? Okay, so um, the representation vector just tells you how to write B1 as a linear combination of B1, B2, and B3. And since B1 is equal to um, 1 times B1 plus 0 times B2 plus 0 times B3, then the representation is just 1, 0, 0. And similarly, the representation of B2 with respect to B is equal to 0, 1, 0, because B2 is equal to 0, B1, plus 1, B2, plus 0, B3. And then the representation with respect to B of B3, by the same logic, would be 0, 0, 1. Okay, let's apply that here um, with, with this statement. So let's take our matrix A. So the diagonal entries are 2, negative 4, 3. 2, negative 4, 3. And zero is everywhere else. It's a 2. Um, so if I multiply this by the representation of B1 with respect to B, this should be equal to the representation of f of b1 with respect to b. That's just this statement right here. So it's equal to that, but um, let, me, let me actually just move this over. If I actually multiply this out, that would give me, let's see, first row times first column, that would be a 2 plus some zeros. Second row times that column is 0 times 1 plus negative 4 times 0. Uh, that's going to be a 0 right there. And then third entry is also going to be a 0. So um, that's great. That tells me that uh, f of b1 is equal to, so f of b1 is equal to, 2 times b1, um, and then I'll put like in gray, it's plus 0 b2 plus 0 b3. So because these these things are zeros, um, this, this stuff doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to actually erase that because um, I don't want you to focus on that. Um, but anyway, so f of b1 is equal to 2 times b1. All right, let's do it for B2. We can say what F of B2 is equal to. 2, negative 4, 3, 0, 0, 0. If I multiply by the representation of B2 with respect to B, which is 0, 1, 0, that'll just pick out that negative 4 right there. 
So f of b2 is equal to negative 4 times b2. And similarly, um, I can already tell you what f of b3 is going to be equal to, because I would be multiplying by 0, 0, 1. That would be equal to 0, 0, 3. So f of b3 would be equal to 3 times b3. going to write a right there okay so yeah um, these these are uh, examples of eigenvalues and eigenvectors so like b1 b2 b3 would be called eigenvectors for our function f for our linear map f and the eigenvalues associated would be 2 negative 4 and 3 and we're going to talk a lot about in the next uh, section, not the next video, the next section, how to actually find these. But um, so today I just want to talk about if we if we know these um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, then this, this is how we can use them. But so um, anyway, um, this example generalizes to the following lemma. Let me just read the lemma first. So the lemma says that a linear map f from v to itself is diagonalizable if and only if there is a basis b consisting of the vectors b1 through bn and scalars lambda1 through lambda n such that f of bi is equal to lambda i bi for all i. So this is the exact same situation that we had in the previous example. We had b has the vectors b1, b2, b3, and we had scalars which were 4, negative 2, and 3, such that uh, f of bi was equal to lambda i bi. Okay, so we're just going to do one direction of the proof here. Um, so the, the forward direction of the proof um, is basically going to work out the exact same way that our example did. So our example is just like, you apply that to the general setting and the same exact thing happens. You just have a um, our, our map representation um, will we'll have lambda 1 through lambda n for the basis b. Anyway, anyway. Um, let me talk about the uh, backwards direction because I'm starting to say things that are probably wrong and I don't want to <laughs> do that. So backwards direction, what do we have to do? So um, we have to assume this part, assume that there's a basis um, and some scalars associated such that f of each basis vector is lambda i times bi. So that's what we're doing here. If there's a basis B in scalars such that f of bi is equal to lambda i bi, um, that's our so that's our assumption. Then, um, what is the representation in B of f of bi? Well, because f of bi is equal to lambda i bi, um, it's so. Um, it's equal to, you could also write this as like 0b1 plus 0b2 plus, and then wherever bi is, there would be lambda i bi plus like lamb, 0 times bi plus 1, just like zeros everywhere else. So anyway, the vector here would have zeros everywhere except for a lambda i in the ith spot. So this would be the ith spot, and then there would be zeros everywhere else. Now let me back out a second. Okay, now I can scroll again. Zero. Okay, cool. So the representation of f of b1 would be um, a lambda 1 in the first spot and then zeros everywhere else. The representation of f of b2 would be a lambda 2 in the second spot and, zen, and then zeros everywhere else, so on and so forth. So now I can say what the representation of f with respect to b and b is. So I get this just by taking the representation 
of f of b1. Um, so, so I take each vector b and I take f of the vector in b and then I represent it in terms of the codomains basis. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm taking f of b1, representing it with respect to b. And that's going to be the first column of my matrix. And then I do that for each column. So the last column would be f of bn. And I take the representation of that with respect to b. And again, um, the representation of f of b1 with respect to b. That's a lambda, lambda 1 in the first spot, and then zeros everywhere else. For f of b2, it would be a lambda 2, and then zeros everywhere else. Um, and then so on and so forth. So you would just end up getting this diagonal matrix. It looks like this. So you'd have lambda 1 through lambda n along the diagonals, and then zeros everywhere else. And that's it. Um, and so, so now the linear map f from b to itself is diagonalizable because we just found a basis b, um, well, that basis b that we're handed, uh, such that the representation is a diagonal matrix consisting of these, um, which will, uh, I'll just say what they're called, these eigenvalues, which we'll talk more about next section. Um, okay, uh, just a real quick note that this is doing the same thing that uh, we should expect. So the representation of f of bi um, with respect to b is equal to, um, so I take my representation matrix and then multiply by um, 0, 0, 0, one in the ith spot, etc. cetera, um, right? Because this is the representation in B of Bi. Um, and this product is equal to zeros and then a lambda i in the ith spot and then zeros everywhere else, um, which would tell us that f of Bi is 